Welcome to Intermediate Biostatistics. I'm Michelle Su, and I'll be teaching you on today's topic, classification. If you have any questions about today's material, feel free to send me an email. A little bit of background about myself. I received my master's degree in statistics from Boston University, and I am physically based in the Northeast region of the US. It's my pleasure to be here today. Today, we'll be covering sections on classification concept, contingency table and confusion matrix, and ways to evaluate the classification rule by using measures of sensitivity and specificity, positive and negative predictive values, as well as ROC curve. Before we end the class, we'll summarize today's material. So classification is very popular in today's physician medicine and in genomics, but then let's start with the concept and then we'll dive in more in terms of its applications. So by definition, classification is used to predict a qualitative response with some statistical modeling involved. As a starting point, you can think of it this way, right? You receive a new set of data about your patient's age, sex, some biomarkers values, and you want to predict whether the patient is diabetic or not. So you have two possible outcomes and a set of variables. So you can use that just the regression model as an example of a binary classifier, right? To model the, the po um, probabilities of having an event um, with function of age, sex, and biomarkers. And the event here is patient having, the diabetes, having diabetes. So, but then there are also many other binary classifiers, right? In machine learning or in advanced statistics, um, you can use k-nearest method, you can use um, random forest, right? So how do we determine which model, which techniques works the best, or even to test them and to compare, right? So in order to do that, we need to start a procedure called um, cross validation. So let me just bring up the um, whiteboard here um, to illustrate the procedure. It's very short and straightforward. So basically the first step is that you split the data set you have into training and testing data set. And typically the general rule of thumb is about 75% for training data set and about 25% for testing, right? So I'm just going to type in here training set for 75% and it's called training because we'll, be, we'll use this training data set to build or to train the classification rule that we're interested to learn more. So this is also uh, with the, the data that already had the label set. That's why we, we want to use this as a training set and then for the remaining 25%, we'll call it a testing data set or a testing set. So I'll put 25%. So we use the rule to classify the new samples in this testing set. And it's also very important to, to um, evaluate the accuracy of the rule, right? So let's say if you're um, interested to test uh, that's just regression. Uh, then you basically, you split the data set you have into 75% training set and 25% testing set. So by using this training set, you build a classification rule. And then once you have this classification rule established, you can then um, basically test the, the classification rule by using the testing set. And then you summarize how this technique, how this model performs on the testing set, right? So then if you are interested to use more method, let's say method two, method three, then you basically do the same thing. Um, so in the end, um, we will summarize all the, how the each method perform on the testing set. So one way to describe the outcome performance is by using um, contingency table and confusion matrix. So that's our uh, next slide, I believe. 
for every new observation being classified and labeled in the cross-validation process, we will observe four possible scenarios, which can then be displayed by using contingency table and confusion matrix. So contingency table is basically a table showing the distribution of one categorical in row and one categorical variable in column, whereas confusion matrix is able to define the performance of a classification algorithm. So what I have here is the confusion matrix showing rules predicted, which represents what the model predicts, and observed column represents patient's actual disease status. So true positive and true negative would be the scenarios when the model is able to correctly identify patient's actual disease status. And um, let me bring up the highlight in red. So um, false positive and false negative then would be um, the scenarios when the model misclassify patient's actual disease status. To evaluate the classification rule in statistics, we want to have summary measures. So today we're going to introduce you four. Two of them are sensitivity and specificity. So by definition, sensitivity is the percentage of patients with disease were correctly identified as positive. And specificity by definition is the percentage of patients without disease were correctly identified as negative. So in the case where we want to test the validity of a screening test, sensitivity measures how accurate a screening test is in identifying disease in patients who truly have the disease. And specificity focuses on the accuracy of the screening test in correctly classifying truly disease-free patients, right? So it is the, the probability that non-disease patients or patients without disease will be classified as normal by the screening test. So sensitivity is a conditional probability condition on patients being disease, and it can be calculated by taking the true positive divided by the sum of true positive and false negative. Specificity is also a conditional probability but condition on patients with no disease, and it can be calculated by taking the true negative divided by sum of false positive and true negative. And we'll have an example to practice. Now, the other two summary measures are positive predictive value, or PPV, and negative predictive value, or MPV. So by definition, PPV is the probability that patients with a positive screening test truly have the disease, right? So if a test patient has an abnormal screening test, what's the probability that the patient really had the disease? Then you can calculate PPV to answer that question. Now, MPV is the probability that patients with a negative screening test truly do not have the disease, right? So if a test patient has a, a negative screening test, then what's the probability that the patient really does not have the disease? So in this case, you can answer the question by deriving MPV. So PPV is a conditional probability, condition on patient being in true positive, and it can be calculated by, let me bring up the highlights here, taking the true positive, but the denominator is the sum of true positive and false positive. And to calculate MPV, you can take the true negative and divide it by the sum of patients with negative screening test results. So it's the sum of true negative plus false negative. So to practice here, a pilot trial on a screening exam provided the following results and total 1,000. So to calculate sensitivity, we basically take the 100 of patient disease and tested positive divided by total of disease population and you get 66.7%. So this is the probability of the screening test 
correctly identify the disease patients, in other words. Now, to calculate the specificity, we basically take the score 50. So this is the true negative divided by false positive and true negative. So it's a 50 here and you'll get 52.9%. So in to interpret this value, this is the probability of the screening test correctly identify the non-disease patients. Now, if you want to calculate PPB, you can basically also take 100, but you're dividing by true positive plus false positive. So it's 500 here and you'll get 20%, 0.2. And to calculate MPV, you will take MPV of um, 450. So this is true negative divided by um, 450 plus 50. So that's 500 here and you get 90%. So in this case, right, the probability that the patient really does not have the disease amongst those with the negative screening test result is 90%. So this is actually quite high. Now, if the PPV is 20%, it means that the remaining 80% will be false positive. So extending the rationale for the calculation of PPV and MPV, Bayesian theorem is used to calculate the probability of disease given the test results. So probabilities of test results conditional on disease status are modeled in the Bayesian framework and subsequently probabilities are transformed to probabilities of disease status conditional on test results. So I'm providing you some derivations here. And if you're interested to learn more, feel free to refer to the reference slide at the end of the presentation. So in our practice today, um, you can actually derive PPV and MPV um, by plugging in the sensitivity and prevalence and specificity, assuming that um, disease prevalence is provided as well. So in our practice today, um, we can use the same example here, but I'm assuming the study was representative of a larger population because I'm using the same estimated prevalence. And in order to get the prevalence here, I'm basically taking 150 of disease status patients and divide by 1000 of N total here and get 15%. So if you plug in the values, um, into the PPV and MPV formula, you get the same answers here. So in practice, however, we often use pilot data to estimate sensitivity and specificity, and then see what the PPV and MPV would be under um, various levels of prevalence, um, prevalence being estimated from other studies here. So if the prevalence were 1.5%, so much lower than that of 15%, but we still had the same sensitivity and specificity, then in that scenario, the PPV would decrease significantly to 0.02 as an example, and MPV would increase significantly to 0.99 for the example here. And so the lower the prevalence, the lower the PPV, and the higher the MPV. So even with much higher sensitivity and specificity, let's say greater than 0.9, um, screening a low risk population. So when the disease prevalence low can give very low PPV. Now, all the metrics we learned, there's far our conditional probabilities and are associated with Bayes' theorem. In order for a classifier to label new samples into categories or to classify patients into classes, there needs to be a threshold that can be applied to convert the probabilities into classes. So let me bring up my whiteboard here. And under PowerPoint slides, um, we have an example of using 
two different thresholds. So let's go into this example first, actually. So when we set the threshold at 0.5, base classifier uses the threshold of 50% for the posterior probability to assign patients to classes. And if we were to set the threshold at 0.2, then base classifier uses a threshold of 20% for the posterior probability to assign patient to classes, right? So in these two examples, if I use a uh, logic regression as my binary classifiers with y-axis labeled as probability range from zero to one and x-axis labeled as biomarker values with eight patients and three of the patients are disease positive, four of the patients are, five of the patients are disease negative, right? So if my threshold level is at 0 0.5, it basically means that when I set the card up right here, and trace the records vertically, any subjects that fall above the 0 0.5 level will be classified as positive. So in this case, we will have about three patients being misclassified as positive. Now in the example, we also had a threshold level that said at level of 0 0.2. In this case, will well misclassify more patients into positive disease status. So our false positive rate would increase here. So in any case, let's go back to the PowerPoint. The observation is that if the screening test sets the threshold for positive higher, sensitivity will decrease and specificity will increase. If the screening test sets the threshold to be lower, sensitivity will increase and specificity will decrease. As opposed to producing many confusion matrices for all possible threshold levels, ROC curve provides a comprehensive way to visualize the relationship between the measures that we discussed and the threshold level. So RUC stands for Receiver Operating Characteristics, and it shows the trade-off between true positive rate, i.e. sensitivity, and the false positive rate, i.e. 1 minus specificity for all possible threshold. And an ideal ROC curve would hug the top left corner of the plot, and it shows perfect discrimination in between the two distributions and with high sensitivity and low positive false positive rate, where does the diagonal line or the dotted line illustrates ROC curve for a test that provides no information. In other words, the distribution of test values for diseased patients and non-diseased patients overlap entirely. And so the, if you look at the curve, the true positive rate and the false positive rate would be identical regardless of the threshold that you set. So to compare, um, providing you a diagram with ROC1, ROC2, and ROC3. And so to compare, the closer the ROC curve is to the top left corner, the more, the more accurate the test is. And the closer the ROC curve is to the diagonal red line here, the worse the test is. So if we were to test a disease that is fatal and would decline patients' health rapidly, then you will want to set a criterion that maximizes the sensitivity and accept a level of true positive rate. Now I know there's a separate R class for the students, um, but I'm providing you a link to ROC R package reference here. So let me just stop sharing. and share my screen here. So if you go to the reference, you'll be able to link further to the entire documentation. So ROC is the R package that you can download and install and library it to use the function. So what I have here, I basically follow the, the codes provided on the documents and I will be able to graph an ROC using the empirical formula as an example. And if you'd like to explore further more, um, you can also use PROC package. Um, that would PROC package. That's another R package that you can install and generates 
ROC graph as well. And the guideline is, has the comprehensive details here. So that's it. Um, to summarize today's class, class validation provides a way to evaluate the performance of a machine learning model. And sensitivity, specificity, PPV, and MPV are measures to evaluate prediction performance outcomes. And to evaluate the classification accuracy, ROC provides a comprehensive view of the prediction accuracy and visual view of the performances across all possible thresholds. The best threshold, though, to optimize sensitivity and specificity depends on the data and the objective of the test. And that's it. Thank you very much, and I hope you have a great day.